Hello and welcome everybody to today's Teddy Award panel. Um, I'm really happy to be here in the wonderful, beautiful Teddy Award studio today and to discuss with uh, five panelists the question of distribution strategies in the wake of the pandemic. Um, it's a really special time actually for all of us and also for me, of course, to do this panel because it was a year ago actually, um, maybe 367 days that I was dancing um, at Volksbühne for the Teddy Award party until like 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning. And I was having a blast, a wonderful time. And I think few of us were at that time aware that this would be probably the last party, like the last major um, party sort of in pre-pandemic times that we would all experience together. And that the Berlinale would also be sort of the last major festival um, that we could all experience together in sort of uh, the regular way or the way that we used to know what used to be regular. And I think now a year later, it's nice to sort of bring back some of these memories and of course discuss a bit um, what has changed and how do we all feel about these changes. And um, I will now introduce the five guests that we have here. I see them all on the screen already, of course, and I'm super happy that you're here with us um, today. And to the audience, um, let me say this in advance, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them and we will come back to them uh, later towards the end of the discussion, most likely. So, uh, hi to the five of you. I'm really excited to be here with you today. And you have one thing in common that you, of course, probably are aware of, which is that you all presented films um, at the Berlinale last year. And you all presented films that were in one way or another part of the Teddy Award. And you did so from very different perspectives. We have here uh, producers, we have directors, we have dis distributors, and we have sales agents. And I think this combination um, of sort of different people doing different things is a really good starting point to have this discussion and to discuss some of the changes. So before coming to this discussion and asking you some questions, I will of course like to briefly introduce you um, as the panelist and I will do so in alphabetic order by your first names, which means I'm gonna start uh, introducing Brian Cole who I was surprised to learn almost, produced his own shorts um, some time ago and was also interning at theaters and uh, the opera in Berlin before it seems he was mostly um, focusing on film and also on photography. Björn started working with Manfred Salzgeber from 1990 onwards and I think here given the fact that we are in the Teddy Award studio it's important to say that Salzgeber not only directed the Panorama, but he also co-founded the Teddy Award together with uh, Wieland Speck. So Björn, you started um, owning uh, Salzgeber from 1994 and have been the director since, and you, through Salzgeber, have distributed more than 500 movies. And two of these movies, Cocon by Leonie Krippendorf, and also No Hard Feelings by Faraz Shariat, were presented very successfully, both at the Berlinale last year, but also, of course, had their cinema releases and so forth. And I look forward to discussing that with you later. Thank you. Next, I would like to come to Maria Vera. She's the festival distributor um, and international sales agent who founded Kino Rebelde, which is an amazing small distribution company focusing on non-fiction, experimental and hybrid narratives. You have, with Kino Rebelde, been representing both um, well-established directors as well as really representing upcoming voices to sort of help them get established in the industry, especially um, sort of on, on broader festival scenes. And um, you have been, for example, at the Berlinale in 2019 with Le Memble by um, Joana Reposi Garibaldi, which won the Teddy Award for Best Documentary. And then last year you were with Playback um, by Augustina Comedi, which won the Teddy Award for the Best Short Film. Thank you very much for being with us today. Now I would like to come to Martin Gondre. You are a co-founder and partner at Best Friend Forever, which is sort of the Brussels based sister company of Indie Sales, which is where you've worked before. And uh, Best Friend Forever was just launched in May 2019, so a year actually also before the pandemic hit and before the industry experienced such broad changes. Um, with Best Friend Forever, you focus on bringing alternative and art house films to the international market, and of course you also do so very successfully, which means last year at the Berlinale you represented 20th Century, 
by Matthew Rankin, as well as Cicity de Lamour by Patrick Schicker. Both of them, Chiha, both of them were very successful uh, films, and I look forward to discussing sort of the distribution strategies with you in a moment. Now we come to Paulina Lorenz. Um, Paulina co-founded the German film collective Jünglinge in 2015. The collective is focusing um, on the exploration of queer feminist and post-migrant perspectives. And with Jünglinge, you were the co-writer and producer of No Hard Feelings, which I mentioned already and which was directed by Faraz Shariat, who is also part of Jünglinge Collective. The film, I think, is pretty much known to everybody. It won the Teddy Award and it played at more than 50 festivals afterwards. Um, and it's yeah, represented by Zeitzgeber, which I already mentioned, so it's also great to have both of you here discussing the film um, from different angles, I think. Thanks for being with us. Last but not least, I will come to Ray Jung. Um, you're also here, I would say, in almost two different roles. Of course, primarily you're with us as a filmmaker. Um, your first film was Cut Sleeve Boys, which premiered in Rotterdam in 2005. And last year you showed the third feature, Suk Suk, um, which premiered in Busan International Film Festival in 2019, and then had its European premiere at the Berlinale. And I would also, of course, like to discuss with you how you experienced sort of um, the journey of this film after the Berlinale, but also it's interesting, I think, that you're the chairman of the Hong Kong Lesbian and Gay Film Festival since 2000, so you have more than 20 years of experience in running a festival and would be interesting towards the end of the discussion to know a bit um, how things have changed for you there now, also working with COVID and the restrictions. So Ray, I would like to start with you first. Um, because you are the only director here um, on this panel, I would like to know from you a bit, um, how was it like last year's Berlinale? How do you remember it now, also knowing that it was um, sort of this last festival in pre-corona times? Um, what does it mean for you? Yeah, it was very special because um, we knew about the uh, COVID-19 because we were in Hong Kong, uh, so we already knew about it. And we were very scared that we might not be able to leave Hong Kong and uh, went to Europe. So I actually flew three weeks before the festival to London first and then to Berlin, just so that I could escape um, Asia, just in case that there was a lockdown. So, uh, so I was able to get to uh, Europe beforehand. And uh, so were my actors because they were shooting. So they were very worried that they would not be able to come. So eventually we were lucky that everybody kind of had this like big escape and then all went to, uh, to Europe and then attended the festival, which of course it was brilliant. And um, the audience uh, reaction was great. And then we went to our parties and met a lot of people. So the whole experience was very wonderful. And of course we have our uh, sales agent, uh, Films Boutique, uh, so there were a lot of meetings and then there was a lot of uh, interest. So um, as soon as we left Europe and then like as soon as we arrived in Hong Kong, then we heard about this whole explosion uh, of the COVID-19 in Europe. And the first week we were a bit worried because we were thinking, oh my God, because we were kissing so many people when we were in Berlin. So, that we, you know, did we have it actually? Did we, you know, come back? And then so after two weeks, we were all safe. So we think, okay, at least the first worry was gone. But then again, the, uh, a lot of the sales and meetings, uh, everything went on hold. So that was uh, a moment that we start slowly going that, okay, a lot of people that were interested, they are not going to continue with their meetings. Uh, so that was beginning to hit us. And then the next thing was that we were already told that we were going to go to a lot of film festivals. And then all those, of course, completely had to um, cancel, you know, during that time. So, so that was the beginning. All those news were beginning to happen to us. Yeah. Thanks. And when did sort of um, festivals take up again that were uncancelled, like especially in Europe, that would go um, physically or online with Suk Suk? Uh, yeah, I think, well, I think in Europe, particularly after uh, July or August, people kind of like beginning to start get used to the idea. And then there were, uh, you know, I think Venice started their own festival, kind of like a hybrid sort of thing. And then, so the festival felt that, okay, they can start, you know, sort of like putting it together. So actually in the summer, and uh, I think after August, September, there were a lot more festivals virtual. 
And then from September to December, I think we attended like 70 festivals, like all over the world, because suddenly that period of time, everybody had the festival. So I was Zooming day and night. <laughs> but I guess <laughs> you didn't travel to any festival anymore or... Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you very much, Paulina. How was it like for you? Also, I guess it was the, sort of the first major success with No Hard Feelings that you produced and co-writeed, um, presenting it at the Berlinale, and then sort of being disrupted immediately afterwards, right? With exactly what Ray was describing, a lot of invitations, a lot of traveling. Um, how did that story go for you? Yeah, um, very similarly. I mean, to us premiering at Berlinale, at Panorama, um, winning two teddies was such a dream. Um, it was really, really amazing. And looking back, I think we were extremely lucky with Berlinale kind of being the last festival to happen before the lockdown. And then also later again, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later, we were super lucky again with our theatrical release in Germany. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I think all, um, same for me, the Teddy Party was the last time I really danced and went to a party. So uh, very, very good memories for sure. Um, but yeah, it was it was similar to us. We had a lot of festivals lined up right after Berlinale, had our like boarding passes ready. Actually, one of our actors was um, already, he had flown to Colombia um, for Cartagena and then the festival was canceled when he was already there, which was extremely sad. Um, yeah, so basically everything was canceled or postponed and we also felt a really long gap, um, both with festivals um, as well as with sales and our theatrical release in Germany was postponed kind of indefinitely um, in the spring. So it was very, very strange that that was the last and the only kind of real festival experience that we've had so far with this film, which is our debut. Um, yeah. Thank you. Maybe Björn, I will come right to you then, of course, because uh, with Seitzgeber, you distribute both No Hard Feelings, but also um, Cocon by Leonie Krippendorf. And they were both uh, in different ways, of course, celebrated sort of as really being um, not only great queer films, but sort of a new generation of young German filmmakers. The other day I was reading an article um, that was speaking overall, as sometimes these articles do, about the state of German cinema. And there, um, these two films, again, were brought as examples of being inspirational and of really giving us a lot of hope for what's coming next. So from a distributor's perspective and also with the long, long experience you have working in the industry and working with so many films, um, how do you feel about these two films and then, you know, them having been at the Berlinale last year and the changes that then came? Yeah, Berlinale was kind of usual for us, kind of a, like a normal festival. We didn't saw any changes. Uh, I guess some people might recognize my office, which is normally the smoking hell during our party. So, um, and normally, and then I always go to holidays right during Berlinale and back. So I kind of uh, got into the trap of COVID-19 in Colombia or in Peru more precisely, and was very lucky to get back. And then it got a bit stressy because it's a company of nearly 20 people working here. So it's, it's a lot of organizing things to kind of just close down a company and to go in complete isolation. Uh, we had a little talk about how long it's all gonna take. And uh, we decided that we follow the theory that it's going to be 18 months that it's all going to harm the business. Uh, right now, I would say uh, I'm a bit wrong, so it will be at least 24 months or even longer. But with our 18 months, which was already kind of a, more on a long tail thinking. So we decided to immediately totally adapt the business model. We did a lot of films digitally, so we had to sacrifice parts of our lineup because it was clear that we couldn't distribute them into the cinemas. Uh, we had to postpone a lot of releases and then we had films like And Then We Dance, which was a bigger title for us, which had to go first. Then there was Cocon, where the TV people pushed us that we really have to do it in summertime. Then there were the 
ambitious jüngling uh, people who also wanted to have something like going out so it was a big big problem to kind of jungle around with more than 20 to 30 titles and at the moment we still have films which we bought in 2019 and have no real idea when to release because we couldn't do it in the short summer time in which we had in germany and uh, i guess overall if we think positive, which we maybe sometimes should do, uh, I think for films like Cocon, also for And When We Danced, or for Futur 3, which is the German title for No Hard Feelings, uh, Summer was really good for these films because uh, we had one thing that was the American studios were not on the German market. So we had time for exposure in the cinemas. And so actually uh, COVID helped these films a little bit for the releases in Germany to say something positive. And the rest is just kind of, I would say, pure horror because you know we have so many responsibilities for filmmakers for people who had to stop filming i i don't even want to start uh, to to think about all these things it's basically the one year now which is a constant nightmare thanks very much for this uh, mixture of optimism and pessimism i guess that you shared so of course now um, i would like to pick up with maria and then martin because you are looking at this maybe from a similar perspective as bjorn is doing um, maria did you have a similar experience then also with the mid or like a vast uh, multitude of films that you are handling right these questions uh, coming up how do i go about this film how about that short film how about the documentary and so forth um, of course also have to, having to engage with the filmmakers and their interest and um, production companies and so forth so it would be great if you could share your thoughts on that and then of course specifically also on augustina comedy's um, playback and sort of the the route that that film then took yes thanks uh for your question well um first of all yeah for me it was the same i mean it was uh the last time that i had the chance to to be in cinemas to enjoy a market uh to see playback in the big screen and it was um it was very tough um, because uh, for sure after Berlinale we had a lot of invitations. I mean, it's very similar to the other experiences. Um, a lot of plans, a lot of expectations. And I think 15 days right after Berlinale, eh, Berlinale everything just fall, you know, like, um, and I start um, feeling like a, uh, a lot of creativity, I mean, coming from festivals, just to try to make it possible. And then we have to adapt also very fast. Um, we were also very excited with Agustina. We, we started working together in her first film. And, but we started five months um, after, I mean, after her premiere. And with Playback, we started from the beginning. So we were uh, really happy to, to start in Berlinale. And, um, but yes, I mean, a lot of challenges uh, arrived um, and it was a very different experience from Le Mebel. I mean, Le Mebel, it also, I mean, it won the Teddy Award there. And um, yes, I mean, uh, Playback, it was in 70 festivals already. And I think the 75% they were online. Uh, that's a little bit our experience. Thank you very much, Martin. If you want to jump right in and uh, speak about yeah. your experiences, no, me, I'm, I'm joining all the all, all the friends here. Basically, Berlinale was a super important market for for us because the company was still quite young. It was only six months, and it was the first time that we had really a booth in a major market with a full lineup, and we had four films in selection. So it was actually an, an amazing week. Uh, with four premieres, with uh, with several awards at the end, including a TG for for If It Were Love. So it was kind of a crazy week, and everything um, just stopped afterwards. Uh, fortunately, we we made already several deals in Berninal that was signed and that kind of secure a basic economy for the film. But all the ongoing um, discussions that we had on, on the film indeed were put to an end or, or put on hold and most of them one year afterwards some ended up with deal but most of them did not and when we we got to we understood that all cinema and all the industry was going to stop for several months 
of course, it was first about how to to protect the company and a little bit like Born, us, our, actually our bad scenario of things was about 12 months, which at the time was already seen like something impossible and something crazy. So now it's going to be 24 months. So and so how to protect our company? But fortunately, we, we are a small company, we are only three. So we have the chance to, to manage to adapt our economy and adapt our cost to, to, the, new, to the new reality. But besides this, quite quickly afterwards, it was how to protect our film, indeed. And um, and when all, all the festival life as well was was going pretty well, we received many many invitations during Berlinale, and all the first months where the festival did not know what to do, and it was really the bad timing, and they couldn't have time to to switch online, was a very very dark time to be honest, with cancellation every day every day, and all the question was how are we going to secure and protect our film and the economy of our films so that they can manage to travel. So quite quickly, fortunately, indeed, everybody switched online and um, and thanks to maybe Shift72 as well, all the festival managed to super quickly sw switch online by keeping the same kind of um, economy and keeping the price as well and the fee for the film, which was super important because uh, it, it, it just kept the, the main gross receive for the film for, for several months before the distributors could have a small visibility on their lineup and their film and what go, was going to happen. And then we, we will go into more details, but, um, but at the end of the day, uh, the film went uh, quite okay. We made several, several sales. They, they traveled a lot and both of them, and when I'm saying the film, it's mostly If It Were Love, Si C'était de l'Amour by Patrick Chia in the 20th century. Um, both of them made more than 60, 70 festivals as well. So they traveled and we managed to switch online and invent a new reality for us as well and how to make visibility and create a space of life for the film. And, um, and this was all the challenge of this year, basically. Thanks very much. I think you brought in some really um, interesting and important aspects, which is, of course, also the economic side to our things, right? As like artists, distributors, producers, sales agents, um, the whole industry is struggling to survive or has to adapt to all of these challenges. And of course, different interests have to be taken into account, both with um, a way that the film may want to take for, let's say, not idealistic reasons, but artistic reasons, interests, and so forth. And then the mere necessity also of having to make ends meet. And it's interesting in all of your responses, of course, um, one can feel this time frame when it almost, although it shouldn't have been a surprise, it hit most people as a surprise and adaptions had to be made rather quickly. A lot of stuff was cancelled, especially when it uh, came to festivals in March, uh, April, May. And then slowly, slowly, what I hear from all of your statements and of course know from my own experience as well, things were switching towards either completely online or to sort of hybrid versions where I think most festivals in one way or another ended uh, up having at least a small online edition while it's being uh, also run in the cinema with limited seating. But of course for the festivals that also then comes with different challenges when it comes to um, money and so forth. And maybe that's something that Ray um, could also embark upon. I think what I would like to hear from you all a bit in the second round is um, what of the experiences since this last year are the ones that stand out for you the most? Maybe also the challenges and the struggles, but are there, for example, for the different films that you represent, festivals or maybe the cinema release or certain platforms and so forth that really stood out for you and felt, okay, wow, um, this is making me really happy or here um, I'm suffering a bit with the experiences. Um, so again, yeah, I would like to start with you, Ray, um, to hear from your experience there. Yeah, um, I, think, I think we were quite lucky because like I said, when we left uh, Europe, when we came back to Hong Kong, actually we already passed the first wave of the COVID. So actually all the cinemas were open and things were running quite smoothly. So quite quickly, we were able to release the movie in the cinema. And uh, because um, there were no big Hollywood movies that were being released around that time. So we were talking about April, uh, May around that time. So um, the cinemas were quite hungry for uh, new movies. And because we also got uh, nine nominations at the Hong Kong Film Awards, so suddenly our movie, which usually is a, you know, regarded as a low budget LGBT movie, was suddenly become mainstream. 
uh, because of all the nominations and also our actor, also one best actor as well. So we were able to open in 60 cinemas in Hong Kong and it actually ran for about six weeks. So for us, we, it was a real highlight because had it been a regular year, I don't think we would have been able to open in 60 cinemas and certainly uh, the run would not be so long because like in Hong Kong, uh, it's very competitive. Uh, usually uh, a movie can only last about three weeks at the most. So we were there for six or seven weeks and actually we closed only because the cinemas have to close down because of COVID. And so it closed down for five weeks and then reopened again and we also ran for another four weeks because again, there was just no new big Hollywood movies. There was no James Bond or anything that was showing. So. Uh, people still wanted to go to see movies, so and our movie was still. So we end up being running for a total eleven weeks, so which was quite amazing for us. Yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting, actually, because you bring up uh, actually the same aspect that Björn has already mentioned, right? That the change sort of in distribution of Hollywood films or American productions um, has created more success than for your films on the local markets, and maybe um, contributing there a bit to more audience turnout. Um, so, Paulina, what were some of your favorite experiences or challenges in the last year, especially with no hard feelings? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge or kind of the frustrating thing was not being able to go to festivals. Um, and we had been looking forward so much to just experience that for the very first time with a feature film um, and to just be in like face to face contact with viewers of the film, with other filmmakers, to watch films, be inspired, travel. And all of that was kind of not taken away from us. It was taken away from everyone, right? And um, I think that was definitely the, the biggest challenge in a way. Although on the other side, as a creative collective, it also gave us a lot of time to kind of be calmer and develop new things. We've been developing a lot of new projects and I don't think that would have happened if uh, Faraz or all of us had been traveling for a year or so. Um, and I think for me, similar to what Ray just said, our theatrical release was definitely the best thing that, that came out of last year. Um, we were extremely lucky or smart, I don't know, um, that uh, Salzgeber and us like picked a very, very, very good time um, to have the release. It was at the end of September um, and we were in cinemas for six weeks. And I'm sure Bjorn can, can say uh, some more details about it, but it definitely went really, really well, um, probably also for the kind of similar reasons. Um, but we really managed to, to get a lot of young people into the cinemas, maybe also related to the pandemic. I don't know that the demographic kind of changed of who um, felt comfortable going to the cinemas, but we also put a lot of effort and energy into doing quite a bit of like community marketing so trying via Instagram to really reach um, young, queer, migrant, post-migrant communities. And we did screenings together with political foundations, activist organizations. We sent our like main actor all through Germany to do little Q&As and to promote the film. We did Q&As in any like Berlin cinema that would have us for those six weeks, just because we really wanted to use that time and sometimes it was really strange as well to be standing there with maybe three or four people from the team and then like 10 people in the audience <laughs> because that's how yeah little people were allowed. Um, but just being able to have those six weeks and same for us, it was also cut down because of the lockdown. Um, and now we're planning um, an online release again, also with some events. Um, yeah, that was just great to be able to be in conversation with the film. Great, right, thank you. Björn, you want to follow up? Oops. Yeah, I think I could say I was very lucky that uh, the team couldn't travel uh, to all these festivals, but they had all the energy to concentrate on the German release. Um, yes, and maybe for for um, for explanation for explaining the situation in Germany, cinemas were allowed to reopen somewhere in May, but with uh, strict cap capacity limits. So it is basically 20 to 25 percent uh, of the seats could be sold. Uh, that was strange system of uh, yeah, uh, having enough space for each other. Um, 
And yes, and in a cinema which then normally have whatever 200 seats, then it's sold out with 40. Um, that is exactly what happened with uh, No Hard Feelings, that it was basically in some cinemas completely sold out for weeks, 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 and weeks uh, till we had to, till the cinemas were closing again. So I think it's a good example, um, uh, meaning uh, overall, it, it, No Hard Feelings is a it's a small film for Germany, yeah, and it was also a small release. It's not a big mainstream release uh, with a big budget, but um, it managed to have at the end after these six weeks and then we had to close again. It, it was about 30,000 or 32,000 admissions, which I think is a hilarious and very, very good result for a film like this out of my experience or to compare it with. And then we danced uh, was ending up with uh, 48 or something like that. So um, it is and I guess if we could have had more exposure in the cinemas, uh, Futo Dry or No Hard Feelings would have ended at least with 50,000 as well. So we were harmed, but at the same time, we were happy and lucky to release at all. And um, now I forgot the question, Merle. What, what, what do you want to know? Mostly you answered it, but I would, of course, be curious about your personal highlights and lowlights, but you mentioned some of them before. Looking back on the last year, great experiences, uh, specifically with the distribution of films and the changes that came. Uh, if I might answer personally, I would say that Actually, it should have been my sabbatical year. Uh, after 30 or something years, I wanted to make a year off. So uh, this obviously did not happen because I felt that the captain should be back on, on the bridge. So uh, I've, I've, I'm thinking that I haven't really worked that much in my whole life like I did the last year. So I totally feel exhausted and um, uh, maybe people underestimate what all this digital sometimes works uh, on a working level. Yeah, like, uh, and uh, so the company is completely in home office, which causes a lot of problems and troubles. Uh, we are, uh, it's, it's a lot of communication, extra work. And I think we really managed to completely build up a, a new turnover structure as well for the company, which is obviously VOD, which uh, we were not really so keen on doing so because uh, for us, um, as a matter of religion, it is cinema first, and then second is cinema, and then third is cinema, and all the stuff like DVD, Blu-ray, and VOD was is not really appreciated uh, by our internal needs. So we had to do then things which we didn't really like to do, uh, but sometimes you have to do it. And good things, yes, I think um, overall, uh, financially, it was a great year. Emotionally, it was not so great. Yeah, thanks for sharing and also being so honest, of course, about the lowlights, because I think a lot of people are sharing that actually that they feel um, exhausted from the different stresses that the pandemic places on them and also the different work regimes that are being established through that different communication regimes. Um, Maria, do you share that experience? And also, of course, um, I think with your distribution company, Kino Rebelde, you have a really... Um, well, broad, but also sort of very specific selection of films where maybe many of them aren't exactly looking for um, cinema release, but for other platforms. So how did that go about? And did new sort of channels come up uh, in the last year for your films? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good point because, yes, I'm working with uh, independent films, experimental hybrids, um, outer point of view documentaries. And um, for me, I mean, festivals, it's, I mean, it's the one stage that it's super important. So when a uh, pandemic arrives, okay, it, it was, I mean, how to deal with this? Because platforms and commercial release, yes, it's something that happens, but uh, it's super important for me and the filmmakers and the films to, to make a nice circuit in festivals. Um, so the first, uh, challenges we had it was uh, to adapt to the online and to start you know working on geoblocking and all this but also with the i mean um by the months i mean we're passing i i started became as a psychologist also you know i mean i had to deal with uh, with a lot of frustration of the filmmakers it was not uh 
because everything was unpredictable um, in every country situation, as, as uh, they said, I mean, Asia was in one moment, Europe was in another, Latin America, so we had to adapt also to, to this. Um, so I'm not so sure about amazing things this year, for sure, uh, we learned a lot. I learned about solidarity also between festivals and distributors and how to make it possible. Um, I felt that we were very alone at home, you know, working and doing, I mean, markets and, and everything, but also trying to not let our filmmakers to go down because, and that was another part of the job, because um, they, they were, uh, um, they were not understanding the meaning of the film sometimes, you know, the films enrich uh, and grows because of the contact with the people they they can feel that um, there are new senses, you know, around their films. So it's like they were not growing. And, and this feeling, in some moments, I felt that um, they were feeling like far away from their own films, you know? That, that it was my feeling the whole year. And um, in any case, I mean, we were having some physical premieres um and i mean or, or um, showcases and and you, this was beautiful but we couldn't be there so at the end you know it it was like no ending um but i don't know i i learned a lot this year i i and i i'm positive you know for the future but uh anyhow it's 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 very difficult for me to to see uh, good things. I mean, uh, independent filmmakers, they have already, you know, they had already their own problems, you know, to establish themselves, you know, to, to show their things. And, and now um, with the pandemic, it was um, more difficult. So, yes, this is a little bit about my experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I like also how you talk about taking responsibility and being sort of a psychologist uh, for the filmmakers. And um, I think what I hear from when you're saying, you know, the sadness that is there when there's maybe eventually a physical premiere or screening, but you can't go there because traveling is so restricted that that's also rough. And it reminded me of Paulina say, uh, what Paulina said, right? That travel was possible, but then you're for the first time for many of us, at least who are privileged to travel the way we are due to passports and so forth, uh, travel again becomes restricted to the national context in a way, right? In the majority of cases. So that limits, of course, a lot of international exchange. Do you want to chip in on that again? Maria? Yes, I mean, like playback at the beginning, you know, uh, we are in South Korea, <laughs> we are in China, we are, but we are not, you know, one day she told me like, uh, so this feeling <laughs> of being there to not be able to see what is happening, you know, with the film, that I have to say, um, it was in a lot of what I call general festivals. It, I mean, it, it's a queer content, but it was in competition with uh, another topics, you know, more, more than the queer festivals this, I mean, last year. Uh, so for sure, we, we, we were, you know, wishing to, to be there and for the filmmaker that she's also uh, working on her, you know, next film, uh this these are spaces also for networking you know to to meet people and it was it was kind of crazy you know and to lose the tracking sometimes uh Agustina particularly she didn't know or she didn't remember uh, which q a she had to do for which festival you know and i had to say okay is this and you have to check the time zone and and the relation even she had with playback and her last film is totally different and for me as a distributor of both films it's very sad so i have a commitment you know to to take her to uh, to a new festival soon and that she can see playback again yeah, and it's interesting that you also bring up the fact of being in different time zones and so forth, because there's, of course, at least some positive aspects about us, like right now being connected live and having sort of a sort of togetherness. But I can imagine that it's strange having all this uh, taking place at home, Q&As and so forth. But Martin, how was your experience? Um, you mentioned that in the beginning already that being such a young and new company, it was sort of hard also from an economic perspective to face everything that was going on. Yeah. 
No, basically, indeed. But what um, I want also to have some kind of a positive um, message here is that in the middle of all the tough and dark times, and even like when I'm hearing about all the good story of the release in theaters in Germany, uh, this is really a huge chance. And for example, us, if it were love, was said to be found, was released in France like one week after Berlinal, this was the idea and the strategy. And the film was for a week in cinema with actually good numbers. And it's got its legs cut with the first lockdown and it reopened in June when cinema reopened, but it really was not the same. So we missed an opportunity here. But also within the crisis, I think from innovation and good things can come from the crisis. And for example, we had some um, some good experience as well in several countries, maybe like Switzerland or Benelux. At some point during the first lockdowns, distributors were looking for new films to acquire to be able to release in premium VOD, which were films that anyway did not have a sale, um, a normal sale or rights and were supposed to be released theatrically in a normal way. And we ended up selling films, for example, in Switzerland for a VOD exploitation for a little amount which ended up six months later with the TV sales. And so with a real economy, and this was sales and, uh, and, and, um, and good things that wouldn't have happened in a normal year, I think. So some good things were coming from there. And also um, us, one of our highlights of the year, um, where we've been lucky was the Venice Film Festival. And this is um, not a Berlinale title, but I do think he's a Teddy friend. We are also handling Saint Narcisse by Bruce Labrousse. And, um, and Saint Narcisse was the closing title of, uh, of Venice Days. Uh, and Venice been very lucky to be able to have um, a, a physical festival. And actually, we were able to have Bruce in Venice. And Bruce was probably the only North American with one or, the, or, or two that were able to come to Venice. He was able to present his film to an audience. And afterwards, the film ended up selling quite well among the crisis to several distributors and several major countries like Germany, France, UK, and the US. So some things happen and some good things happen as well. Some things um, about the future, me, I like to think that now that all the industry swift online and made the investment to to, to have an online program, an online market, an online industry that actually maybe uh, it will be able to stay as, as well for, let's say, um, in, well, in, of course, physical edition, but that now all major market or festival could have a digital extension. And in the thinking of an industry, and when we think as well about uh, small art house distributors, or even cinephile or journalist that usually doesn't have the budget to come to Berlinale and then to Cannes and then to Venice or Toronto, then now there is all a new possibility we're going to see in the future that all those people will be able to experience the market, uh, the market experience as well at the same time, almost as if they were here. And this, I think, is something positive for the future that can come from the crisis. Even if, obviously, we all want to be back together and, uh, and we really, really hope Berlinale and European film market is going to be the last major full digital market, of course. But um, within the crisis, um, all those new habits can bring good, I think, I would say. And, um, and also, from a, let's see, from a sales point of view, there is something quite new, like, indeed, all the job as a sales agent totally changed from a from a job where we usually travel everywhere in the world, meet people physically, meet new people, discover a culture, understand the culture. And for that, I saw what kind of films they are looking for. We became some kind of, um, of telecommunication sellers, only doing Zooms day to day. And this is very tough. And we are, I think we are all getting a bit crazy. But what comes from that as well is all the innovation and the new things happening in digital marketing. And, actually, and I think we are really experiencing it right now at the European film market, where all sales companies are now, uh, now have a budget for digital marketing, also on how to reach audience, buyers, festival programmers through the social media, and not only in the old way with mailings, mailing, mailings, um, on top of mailings. And I would, and I think this is good as well. It really brings a new 
um, a new sales tool to the to the industry. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks for bringing up all of these aspects in the end, because that's precisely where I would like to um, dive into more um, with all of the others as well and discuss a bit now in detail um, some of the changes that the industry is experiencing. I know, for example, with 20th Century, uh, one of the films, Martin, you also um, represent, I think you've sh it's showing on movie, if I'm not mistaken, for example. Um, so I was wondering a bit... Um, How do you feel does a choice like to finally put it on a platform then impact the film and maybe also potential other trajectories that it um, could take? I think for one short moment I would like to discuss briefly, um, let's say, the former festival strategies where films have to go through festival and festival and festival before having other forms of release and how do you make these decisions? Like when do you feel there's a moment, okay, it goes on an online platform now? No, but, um, this is a very good point. I wanted to, to discuss it as well. This is one of the new things as well. Is indeed, well, first, it, it doesn't change. Of course, we 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 give um, priority to festival screenings, um, physical festival screenings, and we would keep not sending a film into any territory for VOD before having a festival premiere. In our case, it's true for all those films. We also like 20th Century or uppercase print by Radu Jude that is now on Mubi as well. And um, and if it were love, it's gone just started. I saw. I think next week. Usually, for films like that, we we don't do any kind of VOD before at least one year and a half or even two years. This year, we decided to to go uh, earlier, like basically right after 12 months, which is usually something we never do. Uh, by discussing with the producers and, and the director, obviously, but the film, as I was saying, at the end of the day, had a very nice festival life. We are more than 60 festivals. And Mubi um, offered this idea of getting the film um, a little bit earlier than, uh, than previously. Um, and we were not against it because um, it's really micro-gestion. The, the films are available on Mubi in um, most part of the world, but not at all any part of the world. And it actually was a big, big uh, work to really precisely decide the territory list. Of course, all the countries where we have sold the film are excluded, but even more, all the countries where we expect that it's possible that we will have a deal in the upcoming six, 12 months are excluded as well. And even more with um, all the countries where the film have already a festival that is scheduled um, is excluded as well. So it's really micro gestion and also all discussion with Mubi to be able if something happen and on a territory where the film can be on Mubi, then a festival come or even another deal come, then we can cut the signal. And for example, we had this case with, um, for If It Were Love, we, um, the film is available on Mubi in Singapore. But a festival came on from the Singapore Film Society, I think, that wants to show the film. They had an issue with Mubi, we cut the signal quite quickly, and the film can go on with the Singapore Film Society. And this, within the current context, I think is a good solution as well, because at the end of the day, beside even the money question, that is a, uh, the film can be seen and made available everywhere in the world and find an audience as well. So it's really a question of balance. Um, all, um, all decisions um, can be different and there are different ways to look at it. But in our case, uh, and after that the film are now available on Mubi for like three weeks, I would say something like this, Uh, I think we took the right decision and this new scheme of really micro gestion territory by territory seems to work well. And we don't, we don't by putting the film on Mubi a little bit earlier than usual, we don't lose any kind of um, possibility in terms of sales. And, um, and in a second time, that's also something that we are not focusing that much before, now even more, what we are going to try to do within the next six months or, or 12 months when the film really, really will have ended up with the festival life is really try to multiply the VOD deal um, on a non-exclusive basis and try to make the film available as much as possible on as many as possible VOD platform on a non-exclusive basis to try to multiply all the opportunity for the film to be seen and of course as well the economic opportunities. 
Thanks. That was very interesting. Thank you for sharing this like specific example because I think it points out precisely some of the differences that are going on at the moment. And I think I would thus go back to Maria and Björn for a second um, to see your perspectives on this. Um, for example, yesterday there is a panel also on um, queer film festivals and sort of how their distribution has changed, how their online models and so forth are working at the moment. And there one of the things that was discussed was uh, screening caps, for example, for online screening, right? So that you have a film actually online with a certain festival but then there's limited views such as 300 or 500 or 1000 um, for various reasons I guess for you know the film sort of not being seen too much and then not receiving invitations by other festivals or also um, it creates of course a bit of this feeling that you have maybe at festivals before like you have to come early you buy your ticket and only then you get to see um, the movies so I would like to hear from both of you first Maria and then Björn um, to maybe comment on some of the things that Martin was saying and sort of yeah the role of distribution platforms now and also online festivals screening caps geo-blocking is another aspect uh, what's your take on that well a um, lot of things uh, first of all um this idea about uh, going online super fast, you know, I mean, to put online, I mean, like a VOD or SVOD. Um, for me was, I mean, normally, I mean, as, as Martin said, you know, something that came after the festival circuit, but uh, some of the directors I'm working with, it, they, they felt kind of uh, anxiety, you know, and they asked me, Maria, can we move, you know, forward with some, so um, I decided just uh, to, to put some films, you know, in, in, in platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we started with those deals. Uh, my company started in, uh, I mean, 2017. So I was going, you know, in the direct way, but, but this year I met a lot of new uh, BOD platforms, very nice, curated and very interesting. So, okay, I start with those feelings then um, in the case of uh, festivals doing online premiere and, and all, all this, um, at the beginning, I didn't know, you know, about, and I had to ask to programmers, uh, so how many views do you think it's going to be? We were learning almost at the same time. And, and with some programmers, I, I, I felt that we were doing like a master, you know, about geo-blocking, IP, PPNs. And everything. And uh, at the beginning, I was thinking, okay, 400 views. And then I start asking the reports. And uh, month by month, uh, while people had to spend a lot of time at home, I think that the demand was a lot, but the offering, I mean, it was huge. So people, they really didn't know what to see. And I don't know. But in some festivals, yes. Uh, we had around 200, but in another just 30 and another. So uh, I put, yeah, I decided uh, to, to have these 400 views uh, for festivals to give for sure another possibilities to another one. Um, but also because I think uh, some festivals they were, they were putting, you know, like, I mean, they were adding, uh, we have this amount of tickets available. So also push people to watch them. Uh, because also, I mean, festivals that they run, I don't know, like, I mean, in 10 days or 20 days, I mean, I think you have to make it shorter. Um, but then, I don't know, like, yes, geo-blocking, it was another important point because uh, I know that at the beginning, the industry was kind of polarized around this, you know? Um, and then I learned that a lot of festivals, they wanted to keep the idea to show for the first time to their audiences some content. So I had to deal with that very, very strongly. And um, because of that, I think that, I don't know, Canada or United States, they can geoblock by states or provinces, you know? So one of my films, it was geoblock, I mean, by hot dogs to Ontario. And then it has the chance to participate in Nouveau Cinema, in the national competition, it's a Canadian film, and it won. And just because of the geo-blocking, you know, so Nouveau Cinema, they wanted to show it for the first time there. Um, so sometimes it's not, it was not easy, 
uh, to, 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 to explain this with festivals, but I was most of the time like uh, having or creating like amazing like agreements. You know, they were open, they were flexible until today. Today, I'm, I'm, uh, have, I mean, I have a lot of films that they are looking for the world premiere, uh, a lot of festivals that they can't say today if in the next month they will make it physically. So, I mean, uh, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, and, and we are, I mean, I'm doing the best, but to be honest, I, the, the last year I, I was not taking new films for 2020. I couldn't like emotionally because of the work as, as, uh, my colleague said, like, I, I never <laughs> was so tired, you know, like, uh, even I was in front of my computer because, uh, emotionally emotionally it was a, a lot um so now i mean i'm pushing and i and my my desire is to have i mean and to see my films in a big screen and to give the opportunity for filmmakers to be there um so i don't know i i separate things as a sales agent i support bod i want that I mean, it's super necessary to not let die our films, you know? I mean, in my case, I'm working with independent films and, you know, something, I mean, films very, very special. Uh, but also I'm supporting festivals, you know, to, because I really think that festivals are, I mean, a political space also. And, you know, for, for queer uh, festivals, you know, I, I have been, and just to finish, uh, in Mojodin Film Festival in Tunisia, I had the chance to be in, I mean, in a, in a very brave festival in Tunisia where LGBT community, I mean, is having a, a very special and hard situation. I really think that those spaces are necessary, you know, and I want to support that. So BOD um, uh, online, for me, it's a plan B and I, because of my way of working, I will keep supporting festivals and I, I will understand if they have to, to do it in a hybrid edition. But that is a little bit my, my point of view. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. I also, again, like the specific example of the film that, you know, had to be geo-blocked to Ontario in order to compete in another festival. It's a bit like the specific example Martin brought up. Um, and Björn, I think some of the points that Maria um, raised, of course, are interesting um, to then take on towards you because she was just saying, okay, VOD uh, will be plan B. And then now with Sidescape, of course, like you mentioned in the beginning, a lot of changes uh, have happened. It's not only that you expanded your own own uh, VOD platform, but also um, now there is queerfilmnacht.de, sort of the night of queer film, where every month two films are being shown or like selected for these two months and you can pay for them and watch them online. And I found that a very interesting concept because in a way I think it meets precisely this, this middle of having a lot of content being online, but then like Maria pointed out, sort of being the problem of, okay, there's so much. So how do people actually know what to watch, uh, how to find the stuff they're interesting and so forth. And with Queer Film Nacht, you not only cater to a specific audience, but in one way or another, it's curated, right? It's two films and they're only available for a month and then uh, they take a different route. And I'm wondering, of course, is this something that's gonna stay? Um, and what are your thoughts uh, on this and how did you go about creating it? Well, we organized the Queer Film Nacht since whatever, eight years or nine years. Um, so it's a monthly film event in 30 something cinemas in Germany. Uh, same as we organize a queer film festival in September in 11 cities in Germany. So we are there with several ideas how to get an audience uh, in the cinemas. Uh, my general remark on hybrid or online festivals is that we are not really supporting the idea that festivals will have an online edition in addition to what they do in the cinemas. Um, mostly because I think all of them lack to have fair business models, meaning they all work with a third party and then they come with 50% or 50% or 50%. So there is hardly no money left for the filmmakers or for the producers. These are not f fair trade, uh, fair, fair terms of trade. And I would like to make a general remark about all this online thing. Um, 
well, we, 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 we do online since ages, um, but uh, there's a very clear learning about uh, where you make money and where you don't make money. And so uh, about 90 something percent of the turnover we make are with the big studios like Amazon, iTunes, Google. And then there's all these uh, other platforms which are really getting on your nerves and need an additional file and this and here and blah, 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 and have own specification. And then you look into the details of a report after half a year where you have called several times to get one at least, and then payment is uh, half a year later and so on. And then there's a turnover of 20 euros or something like that, meaning fuck off. Yeah, that's not, uh, there's no business in that. And it's not the job either of a sales agent or distributor to serve all these platforms for not doing business, meaning we are here to do the optimum and the best for our films and the filmmakers. And what is happening right now is a bit of a nightmare. And I think um, either um, the industry is able to build up something like which is really competitive to the big ones, yeah, that would mean a European solution, uh, uh, yeah, but a real big one. Or we are able to also get rid of these problems of territorial distribution and build up something like a queer international platform. But this uh, is hardly achievable because of all the right situation and all these sales agents in between. So I think that for, for solving these problems, we would need a vision because on the other hand, we also see that a film like El Principe, The Prince, which was in Venice the year before and did win uh, the, the, the Lion there, uh, for example, is not distributed with Amazon because the film shows some nudity. Yeah? And, and I think that's issues we should, really should talk about like uh, censorship issues on, 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 on platforms as well and where we are heading, how do we do deal with, for example, Russia, how do we enable people to watch the films where they really need to watch them, uh, meaning we are from so, at least Germany, such a privileged country and, and my audience is also very privileged uh, 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 and spoiled. Um, and I guess that um, Salzgeber will definitely not support all these strange online hybrid whatever uh, festivals in the next years. We were very uh, uh, experimental friendly in this year and uh, we heard examples as well. Yeah, when there is whatever 20 uh, 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 transactions and the turn of the money is uh, 20 euros, uh, uh, that's, that's, that doesn't really make sense. So uh, uh, the, the, the festivals also really have to think about what we want to do and it doesn't make sense that each of them now has an online edition as well. But I have two specific follow-up questions regarding that. One being, um, are you speaking then more of smaller festivals? Because there I can imagine that, of course, yeah, they will have to sort of work out their own online uh, platforms and then maybe have a turnover of 20 euros. Or are you also speaking about larger festivals that aren't necessarily uh, queer or LGBT festivals, but, you know, where the films may play as well and that consider uh, having an online component. And the other question What? is for Queer Film Nacht then, uh, once cinemas open again, Again, do you consider still running it online because it also makes it, of course, accessible to a lot more people uh, in various cities and at various times? Or um, how do you self view that? Then will it be shut down again? First rule, the bigger the festival, the less they pay. So uh, the big festivals don't pay anything out of their ticket income uh, as a general remark. And we definitely shorten our windows, meaning we will always start with a theatrical release. Uh, and then it might be that after a short period where we normally had whatever six months after where we went out with DVD, Blu-ray, uh, VOD, that we shorten it down to three months. I think that's what's going to happen in the industry. Uh, but cinema will be first and I give you an explanation for that. If I look into my distribution budget for a bigger film like let's say at and when we danced, assuming or uh, summing up the MG, which the sales agent expect from a local distributor, plus dubbing into German, plus decent marketing, we are easily when more, in an investment of more than a hundred thousand euros. Yeah, and this uh, uh, I don't really want to talk 
about figures now, but even if you sell a film now to Netflix, yeah, it is that's that's, that's not recoupable. So we have to be very very precise about where the money is coming from, and we definitely need the cinemas as a turn of income, and we also really need the cinemas as a turn of uh, social thing, yeah, that people are watching something together, and also to build up a film. Uh, and we we clearly see that uh, the film or film which has a success in cinema has a better performance on on the rest of the market. There are also examples which are then more of a 18 or the parental. Uh, we also have films which don't get any theatrical release at all, and then straight to DVD. We also have a great life sometimes, but I think we shouldn't so easily just throw away our business model, which is established since 100 years. Good point. I think I would um, from then onwards like to hear what Paulina and Ray think about this. Of course, um, I will start with you, Ray, um, because you sort of, like I mentioned in the introduction, work both as a director of a festival that's been around for not 100 years, but 20 years. And then also I'm wondering um, how did you feel about Suk Suk going online and sort of having maybe an online career? I don't know, to be honest, for this film, is it on distribution platforms permanently? Are you considering that? Um, it would be great if you could just Comment a bit on your perspectives there and the general debate that we're having. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the movie is uh, well. We were able to release it in the cinema in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thailand. Uh, we were waiting for it to be released in cinema in uh, America, but we've been waiting and waiting, and finally, we uh, decided to release it uh, virtually. Uh, I think two weeks ago. I think. Um, to be quite honest, I would rather have it uh, shown in the cinema first because particularly my movie is the one that needs that time to build up the momentum because it's kind of a slow movie. And also, um, it's a movie that I think uh, it was designed for a bigger screen. So um, if you see it on a smaller screen, it doesn't work as well, I think, uh, personally. And, uh, and, and also, I think as a filmmaker, you will always want your movies to be shown in the cinema. Um, just so that people can share. It's a shared experience. It's like storytelling. You want people to gather and experience it. It's very important. And festivals are very important as well uh, to uh, show it in cinema. So our uh, Hong Kong Lesbian Gay Film Festival this year, uh, we insisted on doing it in the cinema. So we actually waited when the cinema opened and did it, and we didn't do it online. And of course, during half of the festival, uh, the cinemas have to close again. So um, we are going to restart again. Not, the cinemas are reopening again now. So we are going to start again next month at uh, the second half of the festival, uh, which I think, you know, is, is a lot of work, you know, because everything you do, you do it three or four times over and over and over again. Uh, but, you know, that's the way to go, you know, because um, we are in an unusual situation. So that's something that we're all trying to cope. But I really hope that after things are over, uh, we will get back to normal um, times too, really. I think because people have been stuck at home for so long now, and I think everybody must feel very isolated, you know, even with all this Zoom and watching online. And I mean, personally, I think if um, everything is going to be fine again, I don't think I'll stay at home at all. I think I'll just be going out, uh, watching plays, watching movies, uh, go to concerts, meeting people, dining out. You know, I just don't want to be at home, and I hope everybody will be the same as well. Yeah, I totally share that sentiment, of course. Thanks for sharing it. Um, Paulina, you were mentioning that you are planning an online release at the moment for No Hard Feelings. And if I heard you correctly, you were even saying planning extra events around it. So I'm wondering, of course, what does that mean? What does that mean to play, plan extra events in the digital space uh, around an online release? Yeah, so um, we yeah we had a discussion, um, Björn and, and us, some months ago, I think at the maybe end of last year, um, to talk about, yeah, what do we do? Do we wait until cinemas reopen and we try again? Or um, do we go with a, uh, with a kind of digital release? Um, and I think for us, it was important to kind of keep the momentum going um, by having the sh film shown online um, with very, very heavy hearts, of course, because same for us, we, we loved the film being shown in cinemas and of course we prefer that. Um, but now what, um, 
actually, I think you you guys at Salzgeber suggested it um, that we do kind of like an online festival around the release, which means that it's going to be four days um, at the beginning of April um, where there's different kind of events like entertainment events. So for example, there's going to be a segment that's like breakfast TV with our um, one of our protagonists and a activist journalist. But there's also going to be Q and A's and kind of like discussions panel stuff. So I think for us it was important to not just put it online, but have something happening around it that more has like an event character. And I think I yeah I really like what you said, Maria, earlier about festivals and events being also a space for politics and activism and community. So I think that was important to us to say, okay, how can we? move this online, but still create a sense of community and have discussion about the film. Um, but yeah, and I think another another argument for putting it online and not waiting for cinemas to reopen was also the fact of um, inclusivity in a way. So maybe even if cinemas reopen, who's going to feel comfortable to go? And there's people who maybe haven't had the chance to see the film for a year now, since Berlinale, who have really been wanting to see it, and maybe because they've been living in smaller cities uh, where the cinema didn't show in the fall, or because they they are maybe part of a risk group, and that's why they don't want to go to the cinema. So that was also part of our um, thinking. And yeah, I think we're really excited to see how it's going to turn out, this kind of festival idea. Yeah, I think... Uh, what one general remark uh, to understand it uh, maybe a little bit better we are following the rules of the federal law of germany for film funding here meaning the film was uh, very little publicly funded with a very small amount but if you have public money in your funding you have to follow the rules so uh, that's the, that's def is defining the window of six months and actually the six months are over uh, already in march but but for some cosmic whatever reasons you decided to make it to the beginning of April, April which I really liked the idea. Uh, and so, and then we thought, okay, just not do a simple DVD and Amazon and iTunes and blah, 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 VOD release, uh, but uh, let's do something fancy and to uh, try to go back to the cinemas, which most probably will not be possible, but that was also the original idea when starting to plan about it uh, is back in September or in October um, so now it's going to be all online but we wanted to give some extra to the audience as well to just not make something ordinary thanks for explaining that yeah it sounds really cool I must say I mean I'm looking forward to breakfast TV already and I also like what you said Paulina regarding the inclusivity because I think that's an important aspect that I see some potential in online distribution there that for example subtitles are of course more available but also um, audio description for people that um, cannot hear so well and so forth so a lot of people have been commenting on that and that um, also of course not everybody can travel around to festivals and so forth making films more accessible um, I would like to come to my very last sort of questions and directed of course to all of you and would like to begin with Martin um, and actually it's something that I wanted to ask but also Maria already brought it up a bit um, she was saying well you know I couldn't take on any new films uh, for some time because I was tired or you know wondering a bit um, or did I misunderstand you there I don't know no uh, yeah no <laughs> I said that I mean um, I had already premiered at ITPA, Berlinale, and Rotterdam. So I had, you know, like some films and, and, and already another ones. But uh, that year, I mean, I mean, it was so complicated for me, you know, uh, to think how to make it because I had to support, you know, and I had to make move forward my films that I already had. That it was very difficult for me to take new films in 2020, you know, just, or films that, I don't know, premiere during August, September. So I just put the focus in new films, you know, and my idea to release, uh, you know, 2021. And we are in 2021, you know, and, and things, <laughs> they are not so uh, different. So, but this was just uh, what I could do in that moment. You know, it was my decision. But I know of a lot of people with, with films that they just put stop. I put stop in one film that I decided just let's wait. 
uh, but I know from people that couldn't finish the, the films or that they finished and they were just waiting to have a normal premiere. So sometimes uh, now I think, sorry, we have some uh, people with films that they are not finished or they are trying to finish and also a bunch of films, you know, like uh, wait, I mean, looking for a premiere. I know this, I mean, like, uh, so yeah, this is a little bit what I wanted to say, but it was my own decision. Yeah, I thanks for it. elaborating. And I think it's it's interesting that you brought it up and that you made that decision. And of course, all our personal capacities and so forth play a role there and also the times that we're in. Because what I'm wondering, um, first of all, to the three of you, like Martin and Björn and Maria, and uh, later, of course, I will ask a bit of a different question to Paulina and Ray is... Um, that's sort of the impact of the pandemic and also Bjorn was saying in the beginning, okay, we were thinking of 18 months, now we know 24 months of, you know, sort of changes that we have to deal with. Potentially it's going to be even longer, we don't know. So I'm wondering, does that impact your choice, not only your distribution strategy, but also the choice on films that you take on? Also because Ray, for example, was speaking a bit about the importance, for example, of a film being shown on the big screen and I personally also find that there are some films of course that are made for the big screen and that I mean of course you can watch everything on the laptop or whatever but I do believe it makes a huge difference and there are some films that may go better online at home and so forth so I'm wondering a bit as honest as you can if you would like to share um, how this has impacted sort of your your strategies no, but, well like I, I can try to start us at the end of the day, we try not to change anything. We we kept buying film, kept buying film with NGs. We kept um, face into the future, um, thinking that the industry and we should go back soon to some kind of normal. So we kept continue buying film, also developing the company, bigger and bigger film, and going back as well to French film, what I would say, and we actually have a very dynamic start of the year. So even though within the crisis, we have a film in Sundance and film in Rotterdam, two film in Berlinale. So we really keep the work. We've been very lucky to have the selection and to be able to find proper world premiere, even though online, but it was big decision with the producers as well. And we all thought it was the right decision for the film. And I believe it was the case as we have no visibility on what's going to come up into the next month. And that now the next big meeting for the industry will be can hopefully in July, which is like almost six months away. So we have to be prepared for those six months. But um, to go back on if it changed the way we we think a little bit, basically no, but still yes, what we think and what we try um, when we uh, buying film at least for 2021 because we can still have some new film for the second part of the year. We really, even more than usual, try to have luminous, luminous and positive stories. And we try really to have stories that uh, bring faith and that are, um, have a, a good impact on audience. We do um, believe that probably in the next month, audiences won't particularity have the taste to see dark stories or super tough stories. So it's true that we are more looking for comedies, genre films that keeps selling well, or films that have a very indeed obvious niche uh, and have an audience that can be secured even more than usual. But if something I would say that we are looking even more to positive luminous stories even more than usual. Thanks, that's a very, uh, well, upright and comment in a way. Björn, mm. how is it like for you? Yes, audience is definitely asking for lighter entertainment, to put it like that. Uh, we don't really care. We still buy very dark and depressing mm -hmm. and uh, not so funny movies. Uh, but that's uh, the Salzgeber principle. We never really followed what the mainstream was saying. But there are definitely, we get remarks from audience in saying uh, uh, we don't want to see something that's so, uh, sad or uh, uh, dark at the moment. Um, 
I personally buy more at the moment uh, because I normally buy from people uh, which are friends or which I deal with 20 or uh, long uh, more years and I see the need that they need support at the moment uh, I will let it be contracts for financing or MGs for uh, and then we somehow have to see how we solve it later and i strongly believe that we're gonna have a happy summer uh we have a great lineup with also some entertaining and light films like tove about tove jansen from finland uh we are looking forward for a lesbian patricia highsmith documentary uh so i think we also can fulfill the mainstream needs of, of the cinema market for this year and um we might then look go back in a lockdown in autumn that's my pessimistic uh, uh, scenario uh, and then uh, uh, we have to see how to continue then thank you very much for sharing that so i'm looking forward to some of the releases in the summer um maria do you share that sentiment more like happy films audience looking for happy films and has it changed sort of the way that you um continue no. <laughs> wanting to develop kino rebelde uh no i mean like um i have to say that i i i took a um i think for short films you know and i'm 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 i, I don't know i love this form <laughs> i i know that it's like a lot of work it's less money but i really really like it so it was it's a challenge i mean this year i have more shorts than than features um around the topic or everything, I mean, I'm looking for, I mean, as I'm uh, working with a few titles by year, I just need to feel a lot of empathy. And if I have to be totally honest, the only thing that I couldn't support while I was receiving films is claustrophobic films. I mean, mm -hmm. I have to say, or films, you know, from home, from my window, or from my existence, from, a, you know, someone from media class and problems that, that I don't know. I didn't feel connection with that, but the rest is like, I'm super open and this is totally personal. But, you know, I mean, I myself in my company, so I really need to connect with the story. But no, I mean, like, I'm open to to, to everything. I mean, I, I like uh, people exploring with forms and I know also that there, there was a lot of people at home, you know, like uh, looking into their own uh, hard disks, you know, and creating uh, films, you know, with, with uh, images from the past or whatever. Now they are called like um, desktop documentaries or something like that. I don't care really. Like uh, I need to connect with the films. I, I mean, and I'm waiting uh, that a lot of films that I was, uh, that I, I, I met in, I don't know, like in, in festivals that they, they are in a process that they can be finished. Because I realized that there are a lot of beautiful stories to, to be told. And, and I, I think that everything is ruined, like in production. And for me, I don't know, I work, um, documentaries, they can last, you know, three years, four years. So. Sometimes in my field, because I'm listening to my, my colleagues and um, and sometimes the efforts, you know, to, to make a, a documentary and that dream to see it, you know, in the big screen, you know, like uh, they spent, I don't know, three months doing the 5.1 and then the film is going to see in a computer. I mean, so that's my position sometimes where I, when I'm saying that, yeah, I mean, online it's fine and... Um, and I love how creative and how, I mean, uh, because I think it, it was also like a kind of uh, show of resistance, you know, to not let die the festivals and to say, hey, we are going online and we are trying new and different ways of marketing, whatever. Um, at least in my field, you know, I, I'm looking, I'm, I mean, I'm working with the very independent films. Um, so yes, I mean, from now on, I mean, I, I, I really hope that all what we learn and all what we wish, you know, they can, <laughs> they can go, they can find a, a, a way. I, I don't think, I don't want to be radical, you know, from one side to the other. Yes, online uh, allows to, to reach new audiences, new people that could attend some festivals that they are normally in the big cities. So for sure, I mean, it's a way to, to open. Um, 
but I don't know. I, I really, I'm, I mean, I'm waiting, I mean, to see new films, new stories, uh, because we, we deserve to not see just things around, I mean, from our window. <laughs> Totally. And of course, yeah, I have that feeling as well. I'm really looking forward to the new stories being released, but also stories being produced in this time, because at some point, of course, we will yeah. you know, have to see some narratives about this time but that are produced and done in a different way than just shot I, from the window. Yes, I hope to see that, you know, and I'm, and I'm anxious to see that. But let's see, because also we, we don't, I mean, I think uh, the audience probably needs, yes, more fresh, luminous uh concept at least and a reflection of what's going on i think and this will be my very last question directed to ray and then to paulina because um well we are speaking now of course about developing stories about producing films and the difficulties in these moments so um paulina was saying in the very beginning that this time of course um, has also brought for some of us at least the possibility to focus more um, on maybe the like developing content right because you don't travel around so much and um, from my conversations with filmmakers I always hear um, sort of these two perspectives one being if people were in the midst of the developing stuff it's a great time they have more you know time and maybe focus despite um, all the harmship that's going on to to develop stories and then of course what Maria was also pointing out the difficulty of producing at the moment and um, also wondering of course for some people that that are doing documentaries for example or we're in the midst of documentaries right how do you figure in the in the, the pandemic if you've already shot before and now you want to sh shoot again and so forth. So a lot of questions arise and I um, wonder what it's like for you and how you go about developing things. Um, Ray, are you even developing a new film at the moment, your fourth feature film or something else? Um, would love to hear on that. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of ideas, uh, but the my only issue is that because I like to do a lot of research and I like to talk to a lot of people before I actually um, do a treatment and then eventually write the script. So um, so I've been Zooming with people potentially that I can meet up to talk and then we have some stuff like initial Q&As, but because in order to really get to know someone, you need to go out and hang out a little bit and sometimes go to their apartments and just you know look at photo albums and things like that and chat. So I've not really been able to do that. Um, some people were willing to see me, but some people were just worried because you know strangers so um, I'm not been able to do as much research that I would like. So um, so that has been delaying it. So a lot of things in my head, but I haven't really been able to uh, really uh, put a, a first draft of the script together yet. Um, so I'm still researching, uh, but I certainly have a, a couple of ideas that you know I want to explore. Yeah. And so you're more in the midst of preparing then the second half, if I understood you correctly, of the festival? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Cool. And how about you, Paulina, and maybe overall Junglinger Collective? Um, yeah, I think we, like, um, as Foto3 was our first feature, um, and we got so excited that it was going to be at Berlinale, and I think we really used the months before to set up a lot of projects for ourselves, um, so that actually when all the festivals were cancelled or moved online, we had a lot of stuff to already work on. Um, we... I was writing uh, together with Raquel and our collective on a German, queer German web series. Um, and now we've actually been getting quite a lot of funding um, for development and for script writing, uh, which is really great. And I think that's, yeah, of course, where a lot of um, funding institutions as well as production companies or streamers like can put money in right now because it's production isn't so possible. Um, so I think we've been very lucky to have been very busy with developing um, and maybe about the content um, somehow after Futu 3, which is very, in a way, very affirmative and warm and, and light, all the things that we started to develop feel, felt a bit darker and um, more like a thriller, a horror film, drama. Um, yeah, and now and then the pandemic happened and I think, yeah, we kind of there was some of some of the uh, the projects that we kind of put into the drawer again because it just felt a bit too too much, um, and instead did, did some more things that that are more lighthearted or comedic, um, and now kind of coming back to those again because there's the light of summer at the end of the tunnel, um, yeah. So we've been really 
busy and happy to be developing new things and just never want to deal with this pandemic again. Yeah, let's see how that goes. So funny that this topic of lighthearted stuff and sort of the, the sort of desire to see some uh, funny stories seems to be shared, at least by many of us. Um, having said that, I'm happy to see some of you smiling and uh, I hope that you had, now everybody's smiling, that's great. I'm smiling as well. I hope that you had a great time um, discussing this together. I personally enjoyed it a lot. I learned a lot, both in terms of like broader questions um, as well um, as like being really appreciative of the very specific examples that you you gave to sort of illustrate certain points and thank you very much towards uh, the audience for watching it and uh, having engaged with us in this conversation of course feel free to reach out um, to Teddy Award uh, to Panorama to Berlinale and I'm pretty sure to everybody else here being on the panel if you have any further questions and now um, you all being in different time zones I wish you good evenings and afternoons and I don't know what and hope to see you at some point in person again Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> nice.